to talk about interventional approaches for the patient with chronic pain, specifically intrathecal analgesia. And um, what I'd like to uh, look at primarily are uh, problems associated with intrathecal delivery systems and problems uh, associated with intrathecal analgesia. And as you can see in this slide, uh, that overall, the overall incidence of complications with uh, neuraxial uh, analgesia is about 44% and comprises of um, pharmacologic and physiological uh, problems, equipment problems, procedural problems, programming, and psychological issues. Intrathecal delivery systems, uh, of the 44%, the pharmacologic and physiological complications uh, comprise 77% uh, approximately of those 44%. And we'll look at some of the drugs that are used in neuraxial analgesia and we'll uh, um, uh, review some of the problems associated with them. Opiates are the, are the most common agent used for neuraxial analgesia. And as you can see, uh, the problems associated with opioids are anywhere from nausea down to death. Now this uh, problem and the incidence of uh, the problems are in parentheses next to each of the items listed. Now the problem, I'm just going to stop. I'm sorry, I'm a doctor from Ukraine. My name is Andrew Stroke. Come sit down. So, the pro, uh, so with respect to death in neuraxial analgesia, there was a study uh, published uh, last year that looked at the relationship of um, uh, uh, problems associated with spinal cord stimulation for analgesia versus neuraxial uh, uh, analgesia and what they found was it was like a two to three time uh, two to three fold difference in the death rate in those who got um, neuraxial analgesia with opiates and it was the conclusion of this uh, study that um, it was from opiate overdose because the patients were uh, found uh, non-responsive and not breathing and uh, so death is a potential problem uh, it's not a high incidence, but it's a potential problem and, and uh, needs to be aware of. Also, uh, the opiates, uh, I'm sorry, the, um, yes, uh, opiates can cause physiological effects in terms of uh, endocrine system. The hypothalamic pituitary axis can be affected in, uh, in both males and females. So, uh, you can see here um, in, the first, in the first line um, where you get increase in various uh, hormones and in males uh, you get a decrease in testosterone and libido and you can get gynecomastia from low dose of testosterone and relative excess of um, uh, uh, estrogen. So um, females can also have low hormone output that leads to amenorrhea and uh, ovulation and reduced milk production. Now, there's another problem that's thought to be related to the endocrine system with opiates, and that's fluid retention and edema. The exact reason, the exact mechanism for this is not clear, and this can happen not only with neuraxial anal uh, opiate analgesia, but also with um, oral opiate analgesia. Um, uh, some patients will develop uh, peripheral edema that is uh, sometimes but not always responsive to diuretic therapy. Um, the, uh, the etiology of the opiates being the causative effect uh, for the edema is by uh, ruling out other causes such as cardiac or uh, renal uh, issues uh, and if nothing else can be found then the opiates are thought to be the problem and withdrawing the opiates 
and seeing if the edema resolves will lead uh, to the conclusion that it is related to the opioids. Also, opiates can produce uh, low body temperature. Now, another drug that's used in the uh, um, in spinal administration is clonidine, for, and that's used for neuropathic pain primarily, and uh, it can cause uh, adverse effects in the cardiovascular, the central nervous systems, gastrointestinal, and endocrine systems. And uh, its primary effect is hypotension, bradycardia, and if the administration is suddenly uh, discontinued, you can get a rebound hypertension much in the same way that uh, oral administration of clonidine and its sudden cessation can lead to rebound hypertension. Sedation is probably the second commonest, most common uh, uh, adverse physiological uh, response to uh, clonidine. It can also produce dry mouth, nausea, and affect the uh, endocrine uh, system. Baclofen is an agent that is used in neuraxial uh, administration. Uh, its indication is primarily for spasticity, but it is used as an analgesic agent um, combined with opiates and or local anesthetic and or clonidine. And its uh, uh, significant effects are on multiple systems, uh, central nervous system, GI, cardiovascular, uh, genitourinary, and on the respiratory system and musculoskeletal system. Now, uh, baclofen, uh, if there is an overdose of baclofen and it needs to be treated, you should be aware that physostigmine administration is an antidote for the adverse effects of baclofen overdose. Now there's another uh, problem with baclofen and that is sudden cessation of uh, baclofen that can lead to fever, seizures, mental status changes, coma, cardiovascular instability, exaggerated muscle spasticity and rigidity and rhabdomyolysis is reported uh, Multi-organ system failure occurs in some patients when they undergo baclofen withdrawal. And one quarter of the patients going through baclofen withdrawal can end up dead. And here's the reference for it. And so um, we, uh, it, it's, it's uh, associated mainly in uh, patients with um, uh, musculoskeletal disorders and spasticity. Um, like Duchenne's muscular dystrophy or other types of spasticity for which baclofen is administered. Um, so you need to be aware that you don't, you, you have to alert your patient, don't let your pump run out your baclofen to stop infusing because you may end up with withdrawal symptoms and possibly uh, death. Um, Ziconotide is uh, um, the newest agent approved for um, uh, neuraxial administration and um, it has potential for neurological side effects uh, affecting gait and balance and can cause dizziness and there are reports of coma associated with um, ziconotide administration. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it's about a thousand times the potency of uh, morphine. Um, so uh, uh, this is a new drug out a few years, uh, still learning uh, about it. Um, so uh, just be aware of these known problems with drugs that are administered in the neuraxial uh, space. Now, um, there are other problems, adverse drug and physiological effects related to compounding pharmacy error. These uh, agents we give are typically prepared by uh, independent um, pharmacies called compounding pharmacies. They're not usually 
typic, uh, they, they're not uh, commercially available. You have to order it, send it to the pharmacy, they mix it up and send it back to you. So this is uh, an actual case that occurred uh, several years ago where a patient wa was getting a patient with uh, severe fibromyalgia um, and uh, debilitating pain from it was uh, being treated and had been treated for um, about a year or two with this combination of fentanyl, bupivacaine, clonidine, and baclofen in, the, in these concentrations in uh, milligrams. Uh, the, the order for the drug were these uh, amounts in milligrams per mil. Okay, so we order the drug, then we get the syringe back from the compounding pharmacy, and the syringe label matches the order, and, the, and we checked it against the patient, and it was her drug, and we put it into the pump and sent the patient home. Then about 48 hours after the refill, the patient was found by the family seizing and comatose was brought back here to Beth Israel and uh, evaluated and we were called because of the pump and the relative change in her um, uh, mental status and uh, seizing relative to the refill of the pump so we were asked to evaluate whether that was a problem or not. So what we did was we stopped the pump we emptied the uh, pump, we emptied out the uh, uh, catheter going into the spinal fluid and withdrew spinal fluid to try to dilute and wash out the uh, concentration of any drugs that were in her neuraxial uh, reservoir. So we sent the, the uh, contents of the reservoir for an analytical assay. We didn't send it back to the pharmacy that compounded it. We sent it to an independent lab for, farm, uh, for uh, analysis. So this is the result of the analysis. And this is the percentage difference. Here is uh, the fentanyl, which is you know pretty close. Bupivacaine is reasonable. Uh, the clonidine is you know reasonable. But now the baclofen. Look at that, it's 96,000 plus percent difference between what we ordered and what was actually prepared. And we couldn't believe it. So we sent it for, to another lab because we figured this is going to be ending up in litigation so we wanted to make sure. So um, the sample was still in the lab that did this analysis. We sent it to another well, first the, the lab repeated the analysis because we couldn't believe it they got the same results. So we sent it for another analysis by another lab and they got the same results. So um, uh, the patient ended up being in the uh, MICU and so this was a, a clear case of baclofen overdose, seizures, coma, um, uh, unresponsive. The patient was in the MICU for about a week and a half gradually recovered but ended up with residual seizures and the case went to court. We were never involved in the litigation but the, the uh, pharmacy that prepared the drug was and they used the analyses we got as um, part of their um, claim against the uh, uh, pharmacy that prepared it. Okay, what about delivery system equipment problems. So catheter related problems occur about 16 percent of the time of the total um, uh, number of complications that I showed you in the, in the first slide. And here are some breakdown of some of the problems that occur from occlusion, shearing and breaking of the catheter, retraction from the cat canal, leakage, postural puncture headache, development of a seroma, nerve root impingement, pump failure can occur, torsion and turning of the pump uh, can occur. So these are some 
equipment failures and complica equipment complications that can occur when using neuraxial uh, uh, delivery systems. So um, our two fellows here who have participated in uh, putting in pumps and refilling pumps. This was uh, a patient uh, uh, who came back. This is an older model. This was several years ago before the newer pumps were out. But this could happen with a new pump as well. So patient came in, uh, was, you know, didn't report anything new or different, came in for a refill, and multiple attempts at getting into the reservoir were unsuccessful. So we looked at it under fluoro, and we used a syringe. This is a syringe with a needle for orientation to make sure that we didn't have the image reversed. So I'm going to ask you, what's the problem here? How do you know? The orientation of the, of the sideboard is usually the other way. Is to the right. To the right. Correct. Your side port, even in the new pumps, comes off to the right, not to the left. If it comes off to the left, it means it's been rotated. We use the syringe to make sure that we were looking at this in correct orientation. So it was a reference for us uh, uh, as a guide to make sure we were looking at it correctly. So this patient had to go to the OR. It had flipped, and she wasn't aware of it. And how it happened or when it happened, uncertain. But you had to go to the OR to have it revised. Here, this shows you the template that we use. This shows you the film. And this is on the left side. And the port should be on, uh, I'm sorry, the connector should be on the right side in both the old and the new system. Procedural complications can occur with intrathecal delivery systems. Infections, um, refill complications, um, and let me just go back to the uh, pump refill complication, external pump placement of drug, subcutaneous intrathecal uh, side port injections can occur, although it's rare, but um, external pump placement of the drug is a uh, uh, problem that is of major concern and, in, and has happened, has happened to one of, uh, one of our fellows uh, early in their fellowship where some of the drug was placed outside the pump and it prompted uh, the manufacturers of the pump to send a warning letter which I distributed to everyone uh, who has any dealings with these neuraxial uh, systems. Um, uh, so uh, the, the, the warning is that to make sure that you're in the reservoir septum and they gave you guidelines of what to look for. We'll go through that I think in just a minute. Another problem is overpressure. Overpressure uh, is, is uh, still a potential problem, but it has been lessened by uh, modification of the pump itself. What happens in the older system, this is the first, there may still be some patients who are still around with the earlier version of the pump, and this is the uh, Synchromed 2. This is the rotor system, the roller pump that helps to move the solution from the reservoir and this pump pushes the solution out into the outlet to the catheter. Here you have, so you have two heads in the older model. Here you have three heads that push on the catheter to move the solution from the reservoir into the outlet. So what can occur is if you put enough pressure on this side, you may cause fluid to pass, bypass the roller head and push on by and into the uh, neuraxial system. So 
that's what overpressure is. Um, overpressure can occur if somebody goes into a hot tub or uh, exposed to excessive heat because part of the mechanism of delivery of the drug is by expansion of a freon gas that pushes the reservoir bellows and puts pressure on the um, reservoir solution to move it to these roller pumps so they can be moved out. Here, in order to help reduce the risk of overpressure during refills, because this um, was a time uh, when uh, overpressure uh, was uh, a potential problem, was at the time of refill, if you, put, if you didn't empty the reservoir completely, or you, uh, um, say, had an 18cc pump and you had a 20cc syringe, and you were going to push all the 20 cc's in and you, didn't, you weren't thinking about it. So they put in this valve stem here. And so here's the reservoir septum and the needle goes in here. Here's the reservoir. It's a bellows. In here is your Freon gas. So your Freon gas expands and puts pressure on the reservoir bellows and collapses it to move drug out of the reservoir to those uh, rotator uh, pump heads that I showed you in the previous slides. So now this is open. This is a collapsed reservoir. This stem is in the open position. So fluid can go out and if you were to refill fluid could go in. There's no blockage in filling up the reservoir. Now, once the reservoir gets filled, expanded and filled, the stem moves down with the expansion and then plugs the hole. So you get to a certain point and there's a lot of resistance. So you, uh, it, it limits overpressure within the reservoir system that could move drug to the roller heads and bypass the roller heads by the excess pressure that's generated. Now this has led to some problems because these things have gotten stuck. And there's, uh, there's elaborate uh, protocols and regimens uh, that Medtronic has um, provided clinicians if they think that they have a stuck uh, uh, valve stem that so if you if you uh, fill up this uh, reservoir and you can't fill and you you've injected and there's a lot of pressure and this gets stuck then um, you may end up uh, with a stuck uh, open uh, reservoir system and uh, it could affect your delivery of drug uh, this is the Synchromed 2 reservoir pump system. Here's the inlet, here's the reservoir, here's the valve stem. Uh, so as the reservoir fills, uh, the uh, stem moves down and would uh, uh, um, close off and not allow any more drug to be uh, put in and so overpressure would be limited. So um, heat and um, when you, uh, you want to, when you uh, put in a pump, you want to make sure that uh, you, you take the cap off uh, to relieve any pressure that's been built up and want to purge the pump. Um, you want to observe flow uh, through the pump. There should be flow coming out from the uh, connector at the time of the refill and uh, when you first open it up but then there should be no fluid after after you've taken the cap off and relieved the pressure and you see the uh, after the purge you see the uh, solution coming out 
but then you don't have any fluid, there should be no fluid coming out after, you know, after the purge and, and the uh, cap is taken off. Okay. Procedural complications uh, related to pump refill, risk factors, obesity, a deeply implanted pump. If it's the uh, first uh, refill after uh, an implantation, there can be serous collection and local edema that can make it difficult. Uh, the um, the uh, uh, valve activation, the reservoir valve activation uh, might uh, occur if the temperature is less than 35 degrees and the maximum reservoir volume is reached, it'll close off. And uh, also air entry into the reservoir is uh, uh, um, a bad thing as well in terms of procedural complications because don't forget you're delivering microliters per day so if you get air in your tubing there could be a, a period of time it's not dangerous to the patient except they may not get analgesia for a period of time if there's air that traverses your uh, tubing from the pump to the CSF and then in the air going into the CSF there's no drug going. Other, uh, so some techniques to minimize uh, pump refill complications. So when you put your needle into the pump reservoir and you aspirate on the syringe, you should see some air bubbles during the aspiration. When you go to uh, fill your pump and you put the syringe on the tubing connected to the needle going into the reservoir uh, of the pump, when you open uh, the connect, uh, when you um, re uh, release the uh, uh, occlusion on the, on the catheter, you often see movement of the syringe where the pump, uh, where the, the plunger gets sucked in slightly. Um, it was much easier to see this on the older pumps. It's harder to see it on the newer pumps, but um, it's still recommended to look for it. The other thing, if you're not sure you're in the reservoir and you have someone who's obese or someone with edema or maybe it's a serous collection, you want to make sure that you're in the reservoir. Then you administer saline into the pump and then you aspirate and make sure you get back the same volume. If you're subcutaneous, you won't get back the volume that you put in. If you're in the pump, you'll get back the volume of saline that you put in. Also, um, you can do a glucose test of the aspirate. Let's say if it's a serous collection after a pump implant and the patient's coming back for their first refill and you get fluid and it's serous and you say, oh, okay, I'm in, but maybe there's some question, it doesn't seem quite right. So you can test the serous solution for glucose. There should be glucose in tissue and that is another way to determine that uh, whether you're in the pump or not. There should be no glucose in the pump reservoir. Um, this, has to, this is for the older pumps, warming the pump at the time of placement. You don't have to do that with the newer pumps. And don't force uh, uh, volume into the pump. If you hit resistance, stop injecting uh, because you probably seeded the uh, valve stem. All right, other problems. Reservoir volume discrepancies. So according to Medtronics, as I understand it, that the, you know that the pump volumes that you, you get on, when you uh, read a pump is not an actual measure of the volume. It's a calculation. And the calculation is based on how many times that rotor head goes around 360 degrees. Every time that rotor head goes around 360 degrees, it delivers a certain volume within that tubing. 
So the, uh, the, com the processor, the microprocessor and computer component of the pump calculates the number of times the rotor goes around uh, 360 degrees and multiplies that by the volume that is delivered by that rotation each time and calculates what is expected to be delivered. So if you have an occlusion, you can get a reading that you, let's say if it's a 20 cc pump, now the patient comes in for refill and it says that uh, you should have five cc's and you go in and you have 15 well, that could be that the calculation is being done because the rotor continues to turn. It doesn't know that the, the solution is not going out. It just rotates, and then the number is calculated on the basis of the number of turns and gives you what you should find. And so if there's an occlusion at the tip, an obstruction, and the medicine is not going out, then you may have, let's say, 15 cc's in, instead of 5 cc's because it's not emptying, but the pump will tell you you should have 5. So that's why, in my opinion, it's good to record the number of cc's predicted and the number of cc's that you actually get to, to try to look at the accuracy. And according to Medtronic, that should be plus or minus 25% when you go to refill. It should be within 25% uh, of, of each other. So if you have excess volume, then what the, what the pr uh, programmer says you should have, then you may have catheter obstruction, a kink, granuloma, scarring. If you have excess amount, maybe there's pump motor failure. Maybe uh, the rotor head um, is uh, um, not uh, properly uh, turning. It's, uh, uh, it, the, the information is being given to the motor, but if the, and, and so it's calculating that, okay, it gave so much information, it gave information to turn so many times, but maybe the stem, uh, the, uh, stem of the uh, connecting to the rotor is turning but the rotor itself is not going around so it could be uh, that you have a pump motor failure. Also illicit drug activity can occur. So either you have less drug than predicted or there may be more because there have been reports case reports of patients accessing the pump. It was thought, okay, uh, at one point it was uh, said, okay, we have this pump. We have patients who have the disease of addiction. We're going to put these pumps in and give them medicine, and that way we don't have to give them pills. But if you have someone who shoots up, uh, injects drugs, they actually have access their reservoir pump to remove the drug and inject themselves or have taken drugs from the street and, in, and put them in to think that they'll get uh, uh, a greater uh, uh, effect because the medicine is going directly in the spine. So, um, the, so uh, illicit drug activity is among the lists for one of the reasons why uh, there's a discrepancy in the predicted volume and the actual volume. If the uh, volume is below the expected amount, um, uh, there, there is a potential for pump uh, malfunction with overinfusion and, again, the patient accessing the pump reservoir. All right, programming errors. This accounts for about 2% of uh, that 44% total complication rate that was cited. Um, and programming errors occur when you make changes in the drug concentration and you have to reprogram uh, the programmer and reprogram the pump. And if you make a mistake that and you go off by one decimal point, that's a factor of 10. So um, 
that can lead to uh, 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 errors in drug delivery. Bridge bolus is another source of programming error and also complex continuous or what, what used to be complex continuous now called flex dosing in the Synchromed 2 pump is a potential source for programming error. So you need to be aware of those and be uh, careful about those. Um, psychological complications. Patients get screened by psychologists to see if they're appropriate candidates for body image. There, there's um, uh, patients uh, have had this pump put in and then a few months later want it out because they can't stand the way their body looks. And there are some patients who have psychiatric illness and they feel that they get quote unquote strange feelings or other uh, discomforts and uh, problems associated uh, with the pump and they want it out. So psychological issues um, can uh, be a problem and listed as a problem in uh, implants. So we try to avoid that by getting a psychological uh, evaluation. Miscellaneous issues. Um, MRI, the rotor is a ferrous uh, object and so it can get stuck in the magnetic field in one direction and there's a potential for setting changes and also it's been documented that there's uh, heating of the pump during MRI and I forget the exact amount of time that you have to expose but one, uh, one thing it's only like um, a couple of degrees and it is not a very uh, large increase in heat but patients have reported my pump site feels warm. It feels hot after an MRI, and that's what led to uh, studies that Medtronic did. They put uh, MRI, uh, I'm sorry, they put their pumps through MRIs and measured the uh, surface uh, of the um, pump, and they put it in simulated tissue and found that, in fact, there was a rise in uh, temperature with MRI exposure. So if a patient has that, you can tell them, yeah, the pump might get heated by MRI, but it, it's uh, typically not an issue. Also, the MRI can turn, oh, I'm sorry, can turn off the pump. And that's why it's recommended that uh, the patient be checked after an MRI to make sure that the pump has not been turned off and none of the settings have been changed. There's a concern about ECTs, uh, electroconvulsive therapy, that it might affect the pumps, uh, but um, it's, it's not well documented and um, it's a theoretical concern, basically. So uh, you just need to be aware of that, that that's been raised as a miscellaneous issue in terms of complications. Okay, so this is another case of a patient with interstitial uh, cystitis who had a neuroaxial catheter placed for control of severe uh, pelvic and abdominal pain, uncontrolled otherwise. So what I want you to do is focus on this area. Right here, this is going from upper uh, to lower. I believe, and here's the catheter, and I want you to focus here as we go from one slide here. It looks a little bit bigger. Here, not too much change, but here we start to see fluid. And again, we have the catheter in place, and here we see it's bigger, and it kind of stays that way for a few segments. And you see the catheter right here going in. Here's a catheter. And here it's going in the inner space. And as you go lower, you start, you don't see the catheter anymore in the neuraxis, but, and you start to lose it here. It's coming out the skin. And you lose it uh, out, I mean, out towards the skin. 
and here you don't see it at all as you get into the pelvis. So this was a patient who had an asymptomatic, asymptomatic swelling in her lower back over the catheter insertion site. This is a swelling that was found on a CT scan. And she was afebrile, asymptomatic, no complaints of pain, but the skin looked red. It looked as if it was infected. So we got the CT to see if there might be a connection if we thought it might be an abscess and it might be a connection from the skin into the CSF because of the catheter. And um, we wanted to see, where is that cat here? We wanted to see if there was any connection and there wasn't. It didn't appear to be. It seemed to be isolated. So looking at it, and she was a febrile, white count was fine and no pain, but it, it looked uh, angry. And the radiologist didn't think it appeared to be infectious. So what is it? What is it? You're going to take her to surgery, but what's your pre-op diagnosis? How about uh, pseudo-meningocele? It's a collection. It ended up being a collection of CSF. What happened was the CSF tracked along the catheter and collected under the skin. And so you have this collection of CSF, which is a pseudomeningocele. And so uh, the patient was taken to the OR. It was opened up. It was drained. And a uh, figure of uh, eight suture put in to tie off the catheter and stop it from uh, leaking backward. Okay. Now, I just wanted to, in the last few minutes, just um, look at the differences between uh, the current, uh, the new, yeah, the current uh, Synchromed 2 pump and the EL. Again, the EL pump, there's fewer and fewer patients that have it, but it's still around and you need to uh, know something about it. So, this is the EL, this is the uh, Synchromed 2. And the difference is in the uh, EL, you had a net, essentially, over the side port. And that net would allow only a 25 gauge needle. Now there's no net, there's just a single port that allows the needle to go in, into that one port. All right, so there was a big reservoir here, and people would get their medication delivered in total through the side port, and so they modified their um, pumps and put the screen over it, over their pump, and that uh, limited the size of the needle to a 25-gauge uh, needle uh, to enter the side port. The reservoir volume is a little bit bigger, I'm sorry, the reservoir port is a little bit bigger, excuse me. Um, also, they reduce the internal fluid path. So this would be the path, from, here's the rotor where the rotor would be, and it would take the medication from the reservoir and pump it along and out into the catheter. And the amount of internal tubing was reduced significantly. So you have less um, dead space, if you will, if you uh, and need less volume for bridge bolusing internally uh, when you uh, um, change the concentration of a drug. The other thing that was done was a stop valve. They have a stop valve. Uh, uh, a stop valve uh, when you go to access your side port and you inject drug, let's say dye for a myelogram, so you don't want it to go backwards. So this is a one-way valve here, so solution can go out, but if you put a needle in here and you inject, it doesn't go back, can't force its way back into the reservoir. 
this uh, the older model did not have a, um, a one-way valve um, uh, check valve okay so the Synchromed 2 pump is, compared to the EL pump is about a third smaller uh, about a fifth uh, less in terms of its weight it's larger the old pump was 18 mils the new pump is uh, 20 and you have the option now of a 40 milliliter pump which you didn't have previously the flex dosing uh, is an option that replaced the complex continuous and also you now have in the older pump you couldn't have a PCA type device in the new pump patients are able to give themselves a bolus during the day as uh, according to how you program it and um, the uh, size is important for a lot of patients so this is the old pump this was the width of the old pump holding 18 mls and it was reduced about um, uh, uh, a fifth or so in size in uh, dimension not in diameter but in width so it's smaller but holds more solution and uh, uh, the the 40 cc pump is approximately the size of the old 18 cc pump okay so now just uh, to review quickly um, agents for intrathecal drug use and this um, Dr. Soto gave an excellent uh, presentation a few months ago on this and I'm just going to bring it to your attention to remind you so in 2007 there was a consensus conference on the recommendations for managing intrathecal analgesic uh, delivery and uh, this is a summary of the recommendations an algorithm for selecting drugs and I'm not going to go through each line um, and uh, what their ultimate recommendations are there's some uh, discourse on these recommendations it's not necessarily agreed to by everyone but the rationale for it is in the publication uh, upon which this is uh, based now I think this is a final aspect what do you how do you test someone you guys are going to go out in practice you're going to see patients and you're going to be asked please consider patient for neuroaxial analgesia and you're you're going to need to test a patient how do you test a patient do you give them a bolus injection of drug or do you give them a continuous infusion do you give them an epidural? Let's say you have a 30-year-old female. You put an intrathecal catheter in her. She has a very high risk for a postural puncture headache, uh, even with a catheter in place as you're infusing. So some have advocated to use epidural and then transition. What about the location of the catheter? Uh, does it matter where you put the tip of the catheter in terms of providing your drug so when you do your analgesic trials these are things that you need to consider and I just want to look at a couple of these I like continuous infusion and I base that on experience with it compared to bolus and uh, the rationale be, uh, behind it based on this diagram the white indicates bolusing. The red indicates continuous infusion. If you look at the bolusing, you give a dose of drug at this point in time. And it takes time for the drug to uh, uh, get to a certain level throughout the uh, CSF. Now, depending on whether, uh, on the amount of drug you give, you may end up getting a response but it may be for any given patient it may be too much and you end up with toxicity you may have an injection and the onset is 
a period of time, let's say 30 to 60 minutes, uh, an hour to three hours, if it's uh, depending on the drug. And so you may not have any response at all for a period of time, and then the patient says, yeah, I think I was better for a while, but then it went away quickly. And then if you don't give enough, patients vary. Patients are different. Some need more drug than others. If you don't give an adequate amount, then you get no response. So is that a failure or is it a failure to give an adequate amount? So what I like to do is use a continuous where I titrate and I know that after a certain period of time I'm going to plateau in terms of the um, effect of the drug. So um, uh, I'll administer the drug continuously and then let it plateau and if I don't have an adequate response I'm going to up the dose so now it's going to increase some more and then plateau and I might be in a therapeutic window let's say patient says oh yeah I'm, I'm doing better but you know it's it's not as good as I'd like it to be Do you think we can do it any better so now we add another dose uh, increase in the infusion and now you get into the range of toxicity outside the therapeutic window and the patient may get low blood pressure, numbness, um, lightheadedness, uh, nausea, vomiting and now you lower the drug and it drops down back into the therapeutic window and you know approximately how much you can give the patient um, for uh, analgesia that is the maximum of that drug that you can give without side effects. And the patient has to determine, is it worth getting a pump for that amount of relief? Now, I personally prefer intrathecal administration, not epidural, except in um, the cervical region. In the cervical region, with a spinal cord, I, I'm not going to attempt to get into the CSF and pass a catheter because of concern of spinal cord injury. So I'll put a epidural catheter in and then uh, uh, convert it to an intrathecal dosing if the epidural is successful. So that's my personal bias. You guys will have to decide, are you going to put in a single needle and give an injection? Are you going to bring the patient in to the hospital, put in a catheter and run an infusion? Does it matter where you put the tip of your catheter? Well, let me ask you, where does local anesthetic work? Dr. Soto, Dr. Chen, where is the action of local anesthetic? What part of the nervous system? Your bupivacaine that you put in the pump. Where is it acting? Is it acting in the cord or is it acting in the nerve roots? Well, it's always the nerve roots. Local anesthetics have their primary action on nerve roots. Even if you put a catheter in the cervical region, its effect is on the nerve roots. It's not on the cord. Where do opiates, clonidine, and the other drugs that we give, baclofen, where do they act? On the spinal cord or on the nerve roots? Any idea? You have a chance, 50-50 chance. Spinal cord, right? So opiates act on the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. So the opiates are going to act in the body of the cord. The local anesthetic is going to act on the nerve roots. Now, you want your catheter to be in a position so that it gets the nerve roots and the uh, cord if you're using a local anesthetic and another agent. Now, if you look here, let's say you have a patient who has pain in the uh, um, uh, pelvic region. 
And so your origin of pain in the pelvic region uh, sympathetically or uh, originates from about T11, T12. So this is the afferent input. Now if you have someone who has pelvic pain and you put in a catheter here and you put your drug here, the opiate or the other agent that you have to give has to diffuse up the CSF to T11, 12 segments to have its action. That means there's a gradient. From here to here, there's going to be a drug gradient. Your, if you have your catheter, the drug comes out, its highest concentration. When it comes out, it gets diluted by the CSF. It does eventually migrate and also gets carried by the CSF circulation, cephalad. But you're going to need more opioid or other agent here. You might get the nerve roots. And plus, you'll get the nerve roots of other areas of the body you may not want, such as um, uh, the sacrum, the lumbar area. If you put it in and give local anesthetic, well, you know, here's the nerve roots for T12 and 11, and this is what you want to target. So you put your catheter down here and you have to get enough drug up to the nerve roots, enough local anesthetic to the nerve roots, enough opioid, baclofen, clonidine up to the spinal cord segments that are affected. And so there's a concentration gradient. The local anesthetic is going to be affecting all of these nerves with the highest concentration down here. So you may end up with more numbness, more um, uh, send, uh, motor block, uh, hypotension, and you may end up with more side effects from your other drug because of the amount that you have to give to get uh, like bladder and bowel, let's say opiate bladder and bowel uh, problems because the drug will affect uh, your sacrum and uh, your sacral root, uh, your sacral cord segments and affect your bladder and bowel function before it gets up to your T11, T12 segment. So when you place a catheter, when I place a catheter, if it's pelvic pain primarily, then I want to place the catheter at the T11, T12 cord region, so I'll try to get my local only on those spinal uh, nerves that come out from that segment and with most of the other agents, the opioids and so forth, near as close as possible to those cord segments. Now you have to realize that there's a differential in the cord location and the vertebral body. So here is T11 but that's approximately at T8, T9. T12 is approximately at T9. Um, and so you, so I want, I like, if I have a pelvic pain that I need to address and I would want to put the tip of the catheter at around T8, T9 to have it as close as possible to the afferent input and the, um, uh, spinal cord segments that are processing the information from the area of concern. Okay, and that's it.